Dr. Alun Burstein is a visiting assistant professor and an Israel Institute fellow in the Department of Political Science at UCI. His research focuses on social mobilization and collective action, specifically the dynamics that lead groups to adopt varying forms of protest. His recent research projects have analyzed the dynamics of repression and violence in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, minority mobilization in Israel, processes of, regional, of religionization and secularization in international terror groups, as well as specifically within the Middle East, and the rise of xenophobic white power terrorism across the world. Professor Burstein has also recently written on the process of democratic backsliding in Israel, specifically its effects on the Israeli in the Israeli-Palestinian arena. And as I said, he is one of the leaders of unacceptable that have organized protests in Israel and around the world. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alon Burstein. It's told about this distance. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful introduction and for the opportunity to be part of this wonderful congregation. Um, I'm glad to speak louder. I was warned that if I speak too loud, it's going to have a backlash. So I will speak louder. Is this better? Better? Signal me if it's too loud or not loud enough. <laughs> um, so it is true that I just returned from Israel. Um, however, this talk is not going to be about that trip to Israel, what I saw there per se, although I will say that a lot of the pictures of the different protests, not the one of the government up there, were taken by me during this trip. Um, while I am a part of Unacceptable, and there are several people who are part of our movement in the crowd, and I see all of you wearing the protest shirts, um, this talk is going to be more to try to elucidate what, forgive me, the hell has been going on. What happened in the last eight months? I called the talk 200 Days of Chaos, Israel's 37th government, um, and I'm going to try to condense a lot of information to try to explain what is the crisis, what the government has been doing, what has been the response, both in Israel and internationally, and where are we now? And sort of as we say in Hebrew, like just, I'll say forthcomingly that I gave a talk several months ago called 100 Days of Chaos, Israel's 37th government. I did not know we would get to 200. That talk was 45 minutes. This talk is shorter and another 100 days. So I'm going to try to do what I can <laughs> to condense the information, but some of it may be a little fast, and I apologize. What I'm going to take us through is the 37th government. Who are they when they were elected? Who are the parties? The judicial overhaul. That is the main crux of the chaos. The attempt to completely overthrow the judiciary and to change the basic regime of Israel. Why? This is such a crisis in Israel. Why is it different in Israel than it would be in the United States or other countries? And then to look at the reaction, to look at what's been going on and the crises that appear basically everywhere you look in Israel. So, very briefly, the 37th government was elected in elections in November 2022. This came after three years of complete political turmoil in Israel. Sort of hard to remember because the last eight months have been so condensed but there were three years in which there were five election campaigns, and the elections were pretty much around the question, can Netanyahu serve as prime minister when he's under indictment for a series of different charges? The election results were what would be considered in Israel a landslide victory, 64 out of 120, in favor of the parties that said they were going to go with Netanyahu, the right-wing parties. Some of them right-wing, some of them ultra-right-wing, some of them ultra-nationalist, some of them ultra-orthodox, and the Likud party. One of the things that's very important that is often overlooked is that the popular vote did not reflect this. The difference in the popular vote in that elections was less than 30,000 votes between the parties that said that they would go in Netanyahu and the parties who were against Netanyahu. It was only because of a failure of the parties against to align themselves properly that this was the result. And that's important because the coalition partners 
the partners that went into the government, know that this is their one chance. The actual results of elections would happen again would not reflect this. This was a fluke that had happened, and therefore, when they conducted their different negotiations throughout the month of November 2022, they all pushed to enact their most radical policies because they knew this is our one chance to do it. And different parties demanded different things. The old Orthodox parties demanded several laws that would allow ultra-Orthodox boys to not go to the army. The Jewish Power Party demanded a slew of racist laws. The Religious Zionist Party demanded their laws. The Likud had only one demand that it kept on pushing. And that was that anything that the justice minister puts forth supersedes anything else and all parties in the coalition are obligated to vote for it. That was their one demand in the coalition negotiations. The government was formed on December 29th and less than a week later, on January 4th, Justice Minister Yariv Levine announces a judicial reform. In a press conference, he states that the government is going to pass four or five, depending on how it's broken down, different articles of legislation that will completely overhaul the balance of power between the different branches of government. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but the main ones, and I'll go through all of them quickly. The, the first one was that the government is going to take control over the committee that nominates and appoints judges, all judges, and specifically to the Supreme Court. Right now, the system is balanced between politicians and judges. That's gonna be changed. It's gonna be completely under government control. The second thing was to relegate legal counselors in go government offices to the role of advisory. It may sound okay, but what the legal counselors and government offices do is make sure that ministers do not violate the law. So if I am Minister of Health and I want to now close down all the hospitals in Jerusalem and decide I'm opening hospitals only in the West Bank, in the settlements, it's the legal counselor in the Ministry of Health that says, no, you can't do that. They're gonna change the law, their role will only be advisory. They were gonna cancel the reasonableness doctrine, which is a doctrine that the Supreme Court in Israel has adopted, I'll talk about it later, because it came back to us, that the Supreme Court in Israel adopted, that says the court can evaluate government actions, is it unreasonable? To dot, 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 I'm gonna get back to it later, so I'm skipping through that. They were gonna outlaw judicial review of basic laws, I'll talk about that too. And finally, one of the most controversial things, they were gonna add what's called an override clause, which would say that the Knesset, which is controlled by the government, would be able to override anything the Supreme Court says with a simple 61 majority. So in other words, if we compare it to the United States, if an act of Congress is passed that says that from now on, Jews aren't allowed to vote, the Supreme Court might reasonably say, well, that's not really constitutional, well, we have some issues with that, and strike it down. What the override clause says is, well, Congress can then come back and say, okay, we override that though. We supersede that with a simple majority. That's the override clause. That was the judicial reform. So why is that a big deal? Why is this a problem? It may seem obvious, but getting into the crux of it to show why it's an even bigger problem. The constitutional arrangements in Israel, which is itself not an accurate statement, because first and foremost, Israel does not have a constitution. What Israel has is a system of basic laws. What basic laws are is tricky. Essentially, when the country was formed in 1948, they were supposed to create a constitution, but I know this will shock everyone, Jews could not agree. They could not agree over who is Jewish. They could not agree over the basic tenets of the country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The list is long over what they could not agree on. And within two years, they realized, okay, this isn't going anywhere. And they came up with a compromise. The compromise was the country will enact basic laws and they will gradually be brought together and become a constitution. That's what basic laws are. They are, if that sounds confusing, that's, that, that is the literal words of the compromise. If that sounds confusing, it is. What does that mean? Are basic laws a constitution? When you pass a basic law, is it elevated from other laws? No one really knows. It's unclear. It's up to the court's interpretation. 
Basic laws, the idea of them are to form the basis of a constitution. So for example, there is basic law, the Knesset, that says the Knesset has 120 members, the seat of the Knesset is in Jerusalem, etc. There's elections every four years, etc., etc. Basic law, the government. And there's a slew of basic laws that are supposed to regulate how the country operates. Factoid number one. In Israel, because, or among other things, because there's no constitution, there is a system that is adopted that's called High Court of Justice. This is adopted from Britain, left over from the British mandate. And that says that the Supreme Court in the country has the right to rule against government actions if they need to do so in the interest of justice. Again, ambiguous. But what that means is, without a constitution, there is still a system where you can appeal as a citizen to the Supreme Court if the executive, the government, violates the law or violates your personal rights and the Supreme Court has the right to restrain the government. That's another factor about the different constitutional arrangements in Israel. The system with these ambiguities lived in peace until 1992. In 1992, two basic laws were passed. One, freedom of vocation, is a lot less controversial, so I'm going to leave that one aside. And the other one was basic law, human dignity and liberty. This was the first time that the Knesset ever enacted something that resembles a Bill of Rights. It was the first time that in Israeli law there was such a concept as equality or enshrined in law, or there was such a concept as people's basic right to dignity. And one of the important things that the Knesset did in legislating that law, it also added a clause that said, and this law supersedes other laws, and it can only be violated by a law that is worthy, that matches the values of the country, and if it violates this law, only to the extent that's reasonable. Based upon that, the Supreme Court at that time said, okay, this opens the door for constitutional interpretation. The minute the Knesset is telling us, here is a law, and within this law, we say, evaluate. Do government actions violate this law? Does it violate human dignity and liberty? That means you're starting to form a constitution. And from that moment, the High Court of Justice started to become more active. It started to restrain the Supreme Court, Sorry. started to restrain the government. In things, for example, when the government would try to annex or steal certain land from usually non-Jews, all of a sudden, non-Jews could appeal to the High Court of Justice, and the High Court of Justice would say, well, this violates basic law, human dignity, and liberty. And gradually, the Supreme Court, sitting as the High Court of Justice, became more and more involved. And this started to really infringe on the desires of the more extreme elements in Israel. So among them, the old Orthodox parties, that for years have managed to bypass laws, including the draft, have managed to add a lot of things that allocate budgets very unfairly towards yeshivas and etc. All of a sudden, the High Court of Justice started to say, actually, this violates all kinds of basic laws. It also was a thorn in parties such as religious Zionism and parties such as Jewish power, who openly say, among others, that Jews should have more rights than Arabs in the country or who openly say that you should annex the West Bank and not give Palestinians their citizenship. So all of a sudden there's been a growing clash over time since 1992, and all of the elements that hate the High Court of Justice have suddenly come to power. One of the things that's important though to realize, and why the judicial overhaul is such a problem, and after this I'm gonna to get to the more interesting part of and what's been happening since, is the High Court of Justice in Israel is the only body that has the authority or the ability to restrain the government, unlike in the United States. Israel does not have a constitution. Unlike in the United States, Israel does not have an upper house. Unlike in the United States, Israel is not divided into federal states. There is no effective local government. Unlike in the United States, Israel is a parliamentary system, which means that the 
Congress, Knesset, is dominated by the government. There is, in fact, no other body that can legally restrain the government other than the High Court of Justice. So if the judicial overhaul were to pass as it was initially proposed, saying that the High Court of Justice cannot review many government actions, adding override clauses and things like that, that is, to large extents, the end of, at very least, liberal democracy in Israel, if not democracy in Israel. Because from that point, the, the Knesset, which is dominated by this government, can legislate a law saying, from now on, there's going to be elections every 15 years, not every four years. There's no, there's no restraint against that. There's no constitution, no upper house. And if the Supreme Court does not have the right to strike that down, there is actually no, nothing stopping the Knesset from doing that. Which is why, when the government announced this judicial overhaul, it launched, by now, 200 days of chaos. Now, as was said, I study social protests, so it's been a fascinating time for me to see how the reform was announced on January 4th. On January 7th, within three days, massive protests erupt in Israel. They erupt in Tel Aviv, and they start from rallying people, and within two weeks, every Saturday night, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people rallying in Tel Aviv saying this will not pass. And I'll add, within about three weeks, protests start sprouting up across the world. Specifically, they started, in this case, in Northern California and in Seattle, and started to spread like wildfire. Now, why is that a big deal? Why are these protests a big deal? Why does this scare the government? The protest movement has been very, very clever. And in addition to rallying each week, they have galvanized different sectors of the population and started to remind them, this is going to be a threat to you. The biggest protest sort of segment has been the high-tech industry. High-tech in Israel not only is a buzzword for Israel as a startup nation, it is quite an important factor for the government, specifically because the high-tech industry contributes about 25% of the, of the country's taxes. All of a sudden, at the beginning of February, high-tech companies are starting to tell the government, we're going to shut down if this reform continues. They start going on strike. Following them, in different segments of industry, the Histadrut, Israel's General Federation of Workers, starts threatening, this is not going to be good. If you keep on doing this, the economy will not survive. And then, at the end of February, IDF reservists start threatening, we will not show up to our volunteer duty anymore. And there's a lot of reasons why they threaten this. A lot of them say, we will not serve under a dictatorship. We're not going to be sent on military missions when the country's not a democracy. There's also legal implications. The fact that the country is a democracy and has an independent judiciary is one of the things that protects the country and protects the soldiers from the International Court of Justice. And soldiers, and particularly pilots, all of a sudden started to get scared because they recognized we could easily be arrested uh, across the world. If all of a sudden Israel is seen as a dictatorship, then there could be international warrants against, against us for activities we did in the army. The protest movement started to gain more and more traction. Within three months, the government, which is supposed to be a solid right-wing government, is facing crisis everywhere it looks. The Knesset is almost shut down because the parties are constantly fighting with each other over each one trying to push forth its more radical policy, again, specifically Jewish power that is dominated by Itamar Ben-Gvir. A lot can be said about him, but suffice to say that he is a convicted supporter of terrorism and idol of Mir Kahana. Um, the Knesset has a hard time functioning. Meanwhile, in February and in March, the economy starts to suffer as a result of this. Different international credit ratings start to say Israel is not a safe place to invest your money. And they are being encouraged by the protest movement saying, in fact, we are not going to be able to survive as a growth industry, as a growth economy. You are correct in your assessment. And the shekel starts to fluctuate. 
In addition to that, diplomatically, Netanyahu now, in addition to being the longest running prime minister in Israel, holds another record as the longest running prime minister without an invitation to the United States. He starts to be shunned across the world, not just by the United States, by other countries as well. And so Netanyahu very skillfully has started to say, well, maybe we'll be friends with China. He started to look for visits in Turkey. He's turning to other countries that maybe fit more his worldview right now. But diplomatically, Israel is suffering. And finally, also security. This, this government came in on promises that it's going to bring a lot of security because it's going to be tough on Arabs, tough on crime, tough on Palestinians. This has been one of the worst years in terms of security, no matter how you slice it in terms of organized crime in Israel, specifically in the Arab-Israeli sector, in terms of terrorist attacks, both from settlers and from Palestinians. Everything's going up in flames. What was astonishing to most people is the government adamantly did not care. They pushed forth with their reform. They refused to stop, no matter what. Each party with their own interests, the ultra-Orthodox parties are scared of the draft. The ultra-nationalist parties have their own interests in the West Bank. Netanyahu would very much like to stay out of jail. So each one had their own interests, and they ignored every appeal for negotiations. Finally, at the end of March, on March 25th and 26th, following some events I don't have time to get into, the country came, I argue, as close to revolt as it ever came. As a result of Netanyahu firing the Minister of Defense because he warned against the judicial reform, 600,000 people burst into the streets blocking the roads, blocking the highways. The next day, the General Federation of Workers, the Estadrut, announced a general strike. The airport shut down, and the country was completely at a standstill. As a result of that, wouldn't you know, the coalition decides to enter into negotiations with the opposition in order to try to soften the reform, try to sell it differently. Which leads us to April through July. For two months, the negotiations have been going on. Throughout this time, the protest movement has continued because many people, I'll say this without being cynical, don't trust Netanyahu. Netanyahu has earned a lot of mistrust over the years. And the protest movement has, in hindsight, we could say very accurately, pointed out this is just a stalling tactic. This is exactly what happened in Poland when Poland tried to enact, and succeeded eventually, to enact similar moves in order to completely take control, uh, for the government completely to take control over the, over the judiciary. At first, there was a massive outcry, and so the government said, we'll enter the negotiations and pass the laws slowly, 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 until by the time there was a public outcry, it was too late. That is exactly what's been happening. Throughout April and May, the protests continued, negotiations continued, Finally, in June, there was no choice. The law required, it doesn't matter, I'm not gonna get into it, the law required something to happen in the Knesset um, to elect politicians in order to serve on the committee that appoints judges. The opposition tried to come to some agreement with the coalition, the coalition refused, the negotiations broke down. Very interesting things happened throughout June. One, for the first time, the opposition managed, along with the protest movement, to create some cracks in the foundation of the coalition. All of a sudden, some members of the coalition voted in favor of opposition members to serve in the committee. So we saw, after six months of utter chaos, that even members likely from the Likud are saying, this is not worth it. It's not worth it. We were supposed to be in power in order to govern, but in fact, all that's happening is complete chaos and we're not governing. So that's a huge success for the protest movements in Israel and internationally. But in addition to that, throughout June, the negotiations completely broke down. And then the masks were taken off of the negotiations and the government decided to push forth its first act in the judicial overhaul. They realized that if they tried to carry out some of the things, like changing the committee that appoints judges, or trying to pass the override clause, they would have a country shut down again. So instead, they tried, to, they tried and succeeded 
to push for one thing, canceling what's called the reasonableness doctrine. The reasonableness doctrine is a doctrine adopted by the Israeli Supreme Court that says government actions have to be within the realm of reason. Governments are allowed to do whatever they want. They are the executive, they are the elected authority. However, if a government completely abuses its power, if a government carries and acts personal laws or decides one day we are going to declare a war and take over China or something like that, the Supreme Court could say this violates the basic tenets of reasonableness. The government decided reasonableness has to be canceled. Now there's a lot of jokes and irony that can be said about that, that a government's pushing so desperately saying, don't worry, we're not going to do anything unreasonable, we just want to make sure that you can't override us if it's unreasonable. A lot of jokes were said about that, but they pushed forward. They pushed forward with this, and leading towards July, we had, once again, a near complete shutdown. This was the month I was there. We had a near complete shutdown. Every week, there are hundreds of thousands of people protesting on Saturday night. However, they also carried out what they call obstruction days during the week. All of a sudden, people are shutting down the train systems by simply flooding into the platforms. They are shutting down the highways. On the day that the Knesset was going to pass this law, there was a practical siege on the Knesset. There was, I don't remember if I ended up putting that picture there. Yes, that's the picture down there the second one of the three. That's the entrance to the Knesset, with protesters barricading themselves to stop the legislators from going in and enacting this law. There was a lot of police violence, and the protesters eventually were swept aside. The law did, in fact, pass. Other things happened. First, once again, we saw that the coalition is starting to fracture. There is a lot of mayhem within the coalition. Watching this live was absolutely incredible. The picture down there is Justice Minister Yariv Levin on the right, Minister of Defense Gallant on the left, the two of them caught on live camera screaming at each other, with Gallant saying, don't do it. This is going to be a catastrophe for the country's security. Levin using a lot of language that I'm not gonna repeat here but the crux of it is saying, I don't care, and Netanyahu in the middle on the phone. This went on, the talks went on, trying to pass this bill for 48 hours in July, and in fact, it was passed. So the first step of the judicial overhaul has passed. Using that step, using the canceling of the reasonableness doctrine, the second steps can now be enacted. Because all of a sudden, the Supreme Court cannot rule against something that the government does and say it's unreasonable. So all of a sudden the government can come and enact a different law, changing the composition of the committee that appoints judges, and all of a sudden appointing judges that may find it now innocent, for example, or lots of other things. Where are we now? Sorry, I'm looking at the time, so I'm concluding. Where are we now? We are heading towards a massive constitutional crisis. Because what is happening right now, four and now more appeals have been submitted to the High Court of Justice saying, cancel that law. You have the right. You are the High Court of Justice. So your job is to restrain the government if the government acts in ways that are against justice. What the government has done to restrain you is against justice. So cancel that. Meanwhile, there's a legal question, never mind an ethical, moral, democratic, there's a legal question here. Can the court that is supposed to act according to the law say, you took away my ability to restrain you legally and I am canceling that? It's unclear what's gonna happen. Netanyahu has been asked in four different interviews. So given this circumstance, if the court rules against you, are you going to abide by that? He has refused to say yes. He has repeatedly said, I hope we don't get there. And it's a question, because that is the makings of regime collapse. If all of a sudden, the different branches of government, the executive, the government, says 
do something, and another one, the court, says, do something, who do you listen to? And we're seeing things in Israel that we've never seen. We're seeing universities, heads of industry, all of a sudden saying, should we come to this position where we're nearing civil war? Just know we're on this side. Or just know we're on this side. The Mossad, Israel's Mossad, had to put out a clarification saying that they will side with the side of justice. That is something that has never happened before. Wrapping this up, because I'm vastly out of time, um, I will end with one note, even though I recognize that this is not, very, not a very happy presentation. I'm not leaving on optimism, but I'm used to that. If you heard what I study, I study terrorism and white supremacy. I'm used to depressing people. Um, but I will say this. As someone who looks at protest movements, this is astounding. Israel's protest movement has achieved more than any protest movement against such moves. What Israel's government is doing is not new. It happened in Turkey, it happened in Russia, it happened in Poland, it happened in Hungary, it happened in India. Parts of it happened in the United States. The United States has such a stronger system of checks and balances that's actually a bit more protected. In all these countries, there were protests. None of them managed to forestall the government the way these protests have. All of those countries have vast array of expatriates. None of them had such a mobilization as has occurred across the world here. And one of the things that is actually surprising, given the radicalness of the current government, is they are scared. They appear to be very scared of the protest movement. This could be because they're very aware that, like I said, if the high-tech industry shuts down, the, the economy has a problem. It could be because Netanyahu loves to have his picture taken with the American president. He absolutely loves it. And that's not happening. And among others, it's not happening because of these protests. There's a lot of reasons why. But there is hope and there's optimism in that. And that's a message also to follow up on some of the messages you gave throughout the services tonight, there is how to take action. So now switching hats from Israel Institute Fellow to one of the leaders of Unacceptable, there is a protest movement going on right now. We protest in Los Angeles, we protest in San Diego, in Florida, in France, and there are people here visiting from, from all kinds of places. These protests matter. They matter because the more pressure there is internationally on the government, the more the government feels there is no escape. Just imagine, for one moment, what would happen if currently the President of the United States was Donald Trump, and he was saying what, how what's happening in Israel is wonderful. What's happening in Israel is good for democracy. The protest movement would have a much harder time. So the fact that there is this international mo movement, international body, that is actually mounting pressure from different locales around the world on Israel matters greatly. So I do urge everyone to take a lot of action, show that you care, support Israel, as Rabbi Rachel said, in the right way, stand up for what's important, and I hope to not come back with a 300 days <laughs> of chaos. I hope to come back with a, and let's summarize what the hell happened this year that is now over. Um, thank you. Happy to speak to everyone after. Thank you for an incredibly comprehensive, um, you know, deep dive into what's going on. It really helps because we've all been reading the stories in the paper and, and watching it on TV. It's Kafka-esque, but I have to say, you know, the redeeming feature is all of those Israelis in the street. They make us so proud to stand up against uh, the chaotic nature of what's going on. Anyway, in the Onig Shabbat, you'll be able to talk to Professor Burstein. So Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Join us in the Onig Shabbat. Thanks again to Professor Burstein.